Welcome to our live stream service here at St. George's Tron. Uh, we're glad that you're able to join us. And uh, there are just a minimum of us here. Laura is going to be leading worship today. And I'm up here, as you can see, and we've got Adam and Anna on the desk at the back. So we're doing the best we can with the minimum crew that we're allowed to have in the building for that purpose. But obviously, uh, what we can't do is see. It's an act of faith to know that you are on the other side uh, of this screen as, uh, as I preach to a camera, uh, to know that you're here. But you're welcome. If we haven't met before, if you've never tuned in to St. George's Tron before, my name's Alistair Duncan. I'm the minister here at St. George's Tron. And we very much look forward to the day when we can be back in this building in person, uh, sharing as we used to do, food around the tables and fellowship with one another. I don't know how long it will be till we can put everything back the way we used to have it and enjoy it as we worship together. But uh, the heart of all of our gathering is that we worship the living God together. And we're going to do that today uh, with just a few of us here, but with all of you at home. So we just invite you to tune out the other distractions and take this time to focus uh, on the living God, on worshiping Him as best you can from within your own home. Uh, if you can put the other distractions to one side, whether that be, I don't know, whatever else might be in your home, then just allow yourself this time. Uh, this is, uh, uh, we celebrate this day as our Sabbath. I've been listening to some podcasts lately, I'll be referring to them later on, but just about the principle of Sabbath. And the word Shabbat just comes from the Hebrew word meaning to stop. Uh, it doesn't mean rest so much, it means just stop. Whatever you're doing, just stop um, and take the time to stop uh, out of all of the other activities of the week. So, the notices for this coming week are pretty standard. The three groups are on on the Wednesday, the encounter group in the afternoon, young adults group in the evening, and then the young professionals group. And at the same time, the prayer group, the prayer meeting is on, uh, on Zoom. So, all four of them are on Zoom on Wednesday at different times. Also, the midweek service goes out on Wednesday uh, between kind of one and two, round about two-ish. I try to get it out by two. Sometimes it just takes a while to upload and so on. So do the best I can. Um, so those are the, the, that's the rhythm of the week at the moment. Other than that, uh, we do encourage you to continue giving uh, to support the ministry of St. George's Tron. You can do that by going to the Church of Scotland page, uh, the, the front page of the Church of Scotland website. Down at the bottom, there's a link that allows you to give uh, online and you can nominate the congregation you want to give to. So trust that you'll do that uh, if you wish to support uh, the ministry here. A couple of extra things this week. Uh, during the first lockdown, we were doing um, we were doing our kind of pre-service prayer. We pray together in here, but our pre-service prayer uh, was online beforehand uh, on a Zoom. Uh, so we're going to reinstate that, and after the service, I'm going to put uh, a link into the SGT social chat uh, to let you know what the Zoom ID for the pre-service prayer is. And also, for a, for a while, we were doing a talk back. Uh, in other words, just giving an opportunity by Zoom for those who want to check in and just have a little chat about the sermon, what you've, uh, the passage, what you've reflected, what it spoke to you, and just have a little discussion and reflection uh, on the sermon. So we used to do that right after the service. Logistically, that's challenging when I'm in the building uh, and we need to kind of clear up and pack up and get out. So I'm going to do it at 5 p.m. And we're going to do that, start that this afternoon. So again, I'm going to put a link. Um, I'm going to put a link in social chat. I might put the link actually on the Facebook page as well, uh, so that if you're watching from afar and would like to join in, then you can do that, um, and uh, we'll see how that goes. So that's uh, today at five o'clock. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll have that and see who's able to join. And we'll, we'll do that for a few weeks. And if it turns out that actually there's not as much uh, interest for it as, as, we, as we thought, then we may, we may just lay it down again. But we'll try it and see uh, if, if it's welcome and helpful for you. So I think those are all the notices. Uh, I don't think there's anything else I need to say at the moment. So let's take a moment then just to prepare to transition into this time of worship and let's just still ourselves and, and, and let me lead you all in prayer. Let's pray together. Gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you, Lord, that even in amongst the frustrations of this season, 
If we put our minds to it, we can easily think of many things to be thankful for. We give you thanks, Lord, for the opportunity we had last night just to get a night's sleep. We thank you for a roof over our heads in this cold winter season. We thank you that to uh, some extent, Lord, we have access to uh, heating and shelter and security. Father, we give thanks for the food in our fridges and in our cupboards. We give you thanks, Lord, that despite all the limitations, we have an incredible health care system in this country. We thank you for all the work that has been done and is being done to make a vaccine available so that we can emerge from lockdown and COVID-19 restrictions. Lord, we give you thanks for all the ordinary blessings that we take for granted. And so as we come to you, as we stop and take this time, we give our thanks above all to you. For Lord, your mercies are new every morning. And as we come into your presence, Lord, we come before the one who is the holy living God. And we thank you, Lord, that you know us and you understand who we are and how it is with us. And as we come to you, Lord, we pray that we may sense and know the touch of your Holy Spirit upon our lives. So, Lord, would you help us to draw near to you? Would you help us to still ourselves, that though our bodies stop, whatever turmoil there might be in racing thoughts or our hearts or emotions, Lord, that we may surrender all of that to you. Lord, we come and we cast our anxieties upon you. We wait in the stillness, and we ask, Lord, that you will come and speak to us, that you will encourage and help us, that you will challenge and teach us, that you will inspire us and restore us. And so as we worship now, Lord, we ask that your Spirit may descend upon us that you'll bless and anoint Laura as she leads us in our sung worship. And may it all be to the glory of your name. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. So I'm going to hand over to Laura, who's going to lead us in two songs, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, and then Seas of Crimson. Laura. Here's my heart, Lord, take and 
Father, we thank you that death is beaten, defeated. And we thank you, Lord, that even though we still journey towards the final fulfillment of all that you've done and promised, we stand already in the victory. We live, Lord, in the completion as well as in the journey towards. We live, Lord, as those who are made perfect in your sight because of Jesus, as well as those who know we are a work in progress. And Lord, you knew us and called our name, summoned us and gave us the gift of faith, sent people to preach and proclaim and share and model and explain the way of Jesus to us. But you already knew who we were. And Lord, we cannot fathom or fully comprehend all that that means or is, but we give you profound and grateful thanks for the salvation, Lord, that is ours because of the revelation of your Holy Spirit through your word. And we thank you, Lord, for all that Jesus has done to reclaim the people of your making, Lord, to reclaim for yourself a people, a countless multitude from every tribe and tongue and nation and language, from every people group around the world. Through time and space, you've claimed and sealed and you call, Lord, all who will hear and listen and respond to believe in Jesus and to know you, that they might know and understand that whatever their earthly experiences might have been, you're a God who's revealed, Lord, to us as a God of mercy and compassion, of forbearance and patience and loving kindness. You're a God, Lord, who seeks to save and restore and renew. You're a God who goes to incredible lengths to show mercy. And so as we come to you, Lord, we come and ask for your forgiveness for everything, Lord, that we have done to uh, ignore or turn away from you, where we've hardened our hearts, Lord, or sought our own to, uh, to live for ourselves rather than for you. Lord, forgive us, we pray. Forgive us, Lord, and break and change our hearts and take us, we pray, from glory to glory. Take us from where we uh, currently are to the place you would have us be. And work in and through us, Lord, we pray, so that we may look and sound and behave and live more and more like Jesus. And that, Jesus, you might be seen and known in and through our lives. So hear us, Lord, as we pray. And as with one voice in different places, 
We pray as Jesus taught us to pray and we say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. We're going to have two passages, both from the two chapters of Revelation today. We're going to take one bigger chunk in two parts, uh, and we're just trying to incorporate other voices as we do that. And so Fiona Morrison recorded uh, uh, herself reading chapter 15, so she's going to read 15, 1 to 8, and then I'm going to read chapter 16 after that. So let's hear Revelation chapter 15, verses 1 to 8 first, which is an introduction to 16, and then we'll hear 60. Our reading today is from Revelation chapter 15. Seven angels with seven plagues. I saw in heaven another great and marvellous sign. Seven Our reading today is from Revelation chapter 15. Seven angels with seven plagues. I saw in heaven another great and marvellous sign. Seven angels with the seven last plagues. Last because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what... Our reading today is from Revelation chapter 15. Seven angels with seven plagues. I saw in heaven another great and marvellous sign. Seven angels with the seven last plagues. Last because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and over the number of his name. They held harps given them by God and sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvellous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this I looked, and in heaven the temple, that is the tabernacle of the testimony, was opened. Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God, who lives for ever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Amen. Sorry about the slight hiccup there that we had uh, had to restart a couple of times just for technical reasons. Let's continue then, and we're going to read chapter 16 as well, which unpacks uh, what Fiona read for us there and was introduced in chapter 15. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly, festering sores broke out on the people 
who had the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned into blood like that of a dead person, and every living thing in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, You are just in these judgments, O holy one, you who are and who were, for they have shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify Him. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three impure spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are demonic spirits that perform signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty." Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since mankind has been on earth, and so tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of His wrath. Every island fled away, and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing about 40 kilograms, fell on people, and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail, because the plague was so terrible. Amen. May God bless and give us understanding of His Word. I don't know what you've been uh, watching during this uh, lockdown. Maybe you've not been watching very much. Maybe you're a, 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 a become more of a kind of TV glutton or an addict or whatever uh, than you might otherwise have done under uh, normal circumstances. Certainly some of the uh, television that, that uh, Ruth and I have been enjoying, uh, and I suppose it's nothing to do with lockdown, we enjoy watching anyway, but we, we particularly like watching uh, Grand Designs, um, which if you've never watched it before, simply uh, follows the stories of people who take on big building projects, sometimes new buildings entirely on a fresh site, but more often than not, a conversion uh, or an adaptation of an existing building or maybe a, a, a radical extension of some sort. And uh, there are some pretty interesting uh, architectural designs realized. Some are lovely, others are not my taste, but that's fair enough. Inevitably, there's a, bit of a, uh, there's a bit of a theme with all of these that someone has a great idea. They uh, buy the plot or they buy the, the old building that's needing developed. They have a budget after they've uh, purchased and then they, they set to. And usually along the way, there are all sorts of issues. Usually along the way, they, they, they inevitably discover that the project's going to cost more than they budgeted for, and so they end up having to work out how they're going to fill the gap or have to rein in their, their design to make it a little more affordable. Invariably, uh, there's the experience either that the, 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 the somebody is involved in the project in a hands-on way, but they don't quite have the skills to do it, or they run out of cash and they have to take on more of the work themselves. Always the project 
seems to take longer than they thought it was going to take, whether weeks or months, sometimes years. And always the people who take part in it uh, are really battle-weary and exhausted, although triumphant and delighted by the end of the program. And Kevin McLeod, the host, uh, is always there to sound a note of anxious worry or doom uh, about whether or not this project will come together or not. It makes for good television, and if you're at all interested in uh, architecture or, or, or um, building work or just the whole makeover concept, I suppose, and I suppose the makeover concept is one that has actually spawned a huge amount of uh, fairly compulsive television over the years. Uh, and some of you watching this will remember when changing rooms was all the rage and uh, people tuned in week after week to watch someone making over a room in a house in some radical way or ground force. It was maybe a team coming in to do a garden. And there's still a plethora of these programs. What is it about the whole principle of taking something uh, and making something new or better or bigger or beautiful. I watched for the first time this week, you'll think I do nothing but watch television, this is not true, but I watched for the first time this past week an episode of Repair Shop. I hadn't seen Repair Shop, but I gather Repair Shop is quite a thing uh, at the moment. And Repair Shop is simply uh, focuses on this kind of workshop where they have a whole load of different experts, whether it be woodwork or leather work or metal work or, or fine jewelry or whatever, and people, members of the public bring in uh, treasured artifacts that they've had uh, over many years that maybe bring back childhood memories or family associations. But these items have fallen into sad disrepair. Uh, they're they're, they're uh, a shadow of their former selves. And so they bring them into the experts who assess how and whether they can be repaired or not. And the rest of the program simply follows each item. And the episode I watched the other night, there was a, a, a lady whose husband's wedding ring uh, had, had uh, broken and become tarnished and so on. She'd lost her husband, and she really wanted the ring to be restored. Whereas another man brought in some um, uh, well, there, for tree, tree staples, for, I think, for climbing trees that his father used to wear, because his father was a tree surgeon uh, and, and, and used to climb these things. But again, they'd fallen into disrepair. And so, you chart the program where they have to strip away everything that is uh, broken or, or failed on it. Uh, the Grand Designs episode we watched this week, uh, a couple bought an old mill down in, in Cornwall, uh, an old stone mill, and so much of the, the interior timbers, which looked beautiful, but actually when they set to, they discovered that the timbers just fell apart in their hands. They were, they'd just gone to dust. They were so completely rotten, they were unusable. And so everything uh, that was old and rotten, everything that was beyond redemption, everything that, that could not be reused or saved had to be stripped out and taken away. Rubble, uh, old stone, um, woodwork, and so on. And it's the same between whether it's Grand Designs or uh, any of the other uh, makeover-type programs or this uh, repair shed. The principle is the same. It's the same in life. We seek we, to, to, to salvage what we can, if we're at all thrifty or concerned for preserving the best of what has been. But inevitably, there's a clearing out. There's a getting rid of. Now, that is a huge, lengthy introduction, but it's a relevant one as we look at these two chapters, because so much of these two chapters uh, looks and sounds awful and fearful the bowls of God's wrath. Well, let's just uh, keep them in perspective and understand what's going on here. Because much of what's going on in this chapter is that whole principle of ripping out and getting rid of, and, and in, in, in spiritual terms, and certainly in, in terms of God's judgment, judging and removing that which is beyond redemption which is so uh, rotten and resistant to repentance, resistant to turning back to God, resistant to the good news of salvation that God has come to offer them in Jesus Christ, that the only option then is to deconstruct in order to reconstruct. And so it begins in chapter 15 with two visions, and these are the last two visions. There's been a series of seven visions. The first one was the beast from the sea, 
The second was the beast from the earth. Then there was a picture of the lamb and his followers on top of Mount Zion. And then there was a picture of three angels, one of a with a message of grace, one with a message of doom, one with a message of warning. Uh, and then there was the image that, that Clark unpacked for us last week of the final reaping, the, the, the harvesting of the righteous to be brought in to the storehouse of God's grace and of the new kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth, and the harvest of God's judgment and wrath. And these next chapters, 15 and 16, unpack that idea that was, that was uh, opened up of this final reaping of, of God's judgment. And so, their last two visions are in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 15. One, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues. And so, a vision of judgment, of plagues of judgment, where God, who has warned, we saw the trumpet blasts earlier on in the book of Revelation, where God was warning those people uh, in the world with, with signs, and the signs that, 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 that make all of us pay attention in life are often signs of disaster, uh, ill health, or a sudden event which makes us think about our lives and put them into perspective. The coronavirus and all of the restrictions, and, and perhaps if, if you or someone that you know or love has been ill or maybe lost someone, it puts things into perspective. And there's nothing like uh, loss or tragedy or disaster to make us think and so, there's a, a vision here of, uh, of, of, of seven plagues of judgment. These are not any more trumpet blasts of warning saying, look, uh, think about your life and think about uh, what would happen if you died today. Where would you go? Would you be with God? What would happen? Are you in a right relationship with God in Jesus Christ? And if you're not, then you need to be. You need to know the salvation that Jesus died to give you. And so the trumpet blasts earlier on in Revelation serve as warnings. But here, there are seven bowls of wrath, which follow in, in many ways along the same pattern as the trumpet blasts, but the trumpet blasts were limited. The, the judgments that followed the trumpet blasts were limited. They didn't harm everybody. But the, the, bowl, uh, the bowls of wrath that we will see are our final judgments if you like, of an intensity and a severity that are similar in theme but greater. And, and so, uh, a picture of end time uh, judgment of God ripping out and destroying all that, unmaking that which is no longer salvageable. And the last vision of the series of seven is in uh, chapter 2 to 4, uh, chapter 15, sorry, verses 2 to 4, this song of Moses. And that's not at all insignificant. I don't know how well you know the story of the book of Exodus and the exodus of the people of God from Egypt, but the language of these two chapters draws hugely on the whole imagery of God's rescue of His people from slavery in Egypt. And so, the, 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 the vision of his, God's people, I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious. You know, when the Israelites passed through the, 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 the Red Sea and, and emerged on the other side, they stood beside the sea. As the sea closed in behind and all of the Egyptians who had been pursuing them to bring them back and, and force them back into slavery were destroyed in the returning waters. And the victorious people stood beside the sea. It was a place of victory, a place where the past that, they had, that God had escaped them, delivered them from and they'd escaped from was now closed. And so they're standing by a sea which glowed with fire. Of course, if you'll remember in the, in the Exodus narrative, it was a pillar of fire uh, by night and a pillar of cloud by day where, by which God served to deliver His people. And so there's this sea of glass and the, the, the people who were victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of His name that 666 number, which we understand as being a, 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 an anti-trinity. Uh, seven is a number of completeness and perfection. It's everywhere in the Bible. And it represents the, the fullness, the completeness, the perfection 
of God. And so 666 is a number we saw that is a, a, an anti-trinity. It's, it's less than. It's incomplete. It's not the fullness of God. It's a less than number. And so here are two pictures, one of judgment on the earth and one of a people already safely delivered. And so if the, the verses that, that, I, that I read in chapter 16 seem frightening and alarming, you have to understand that the, the, the picture that is given before the bowls of wrath are poured out is a picture of a people safely delivered. That's why it's good news. That's why the gospel is good news and the salvation that Jesus offers us as we believe in what He's done for us, as we give our lives to the living God and believe that Jesus died so for the forgiveness of our sins and to take us as His own people is so important because it, to put our lives in the hands of Jesus and trust in Him means that whatever goes on or is going on or will go on in the world, God has put His hand, His seal of protection. And that doesn't mean that bad or painful or difficult things can't or don't or won't happen in life, because we know that they do. And we've seen plenty testimony in this book as we've gone through to the sufferings of God's people, which will be uh, avenged and they will be delivered and, and brought into a place of, of protection, a special place of God's protection. And so, the, the two opening visions introduce uh, a, a new scene, the scene of judgment, uh, which, will, uh, which will unfold. And so, there's the, 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 the vision of coming out of the temple, and the temple and the tabernacle, they just represent the presence of God. So, yes, this is God who is coming as judge, who's coming as judge you know, we often imagine in our world and in our society, because that's what the, the airwaves and the voices of the world tell us, that the earth is ours and we can do what we like with it, that we are masters of, 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 of our planet and, and we, we control it and so on. Well, here is the moment where the opening words of Psalm 24 are made manifest. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The moment where God, eh, from His presence, comes out his judgment, his final judgment on uh, all that is rotten and irredeemable uh, in the world. And so, we have the picture of the, the angels coming out with the bowls of God's wrath, His judgment. And so, we have these uh, last plagues. It's very interesting. I, I referenced earlier on a podcast that I've been listening to, and one of the amazing things that uh, I had never seen before was, was the, the whole uh, concept of, of the, the plagues of Egypt set alongside the days of creation. Very interesting point that the, the speakers in this podcast were making. It was actually a Bible Project podcast on, on, on the Sabbath, and made a fascinating comparison that if you think about the days of creation, uh, if you think about how God created the earth and what events took place, then we have on day one, He separated light from darkness. On day two, He separated uh, sky, uh, air from water. On day three, He separated the land from the water and, and brought vegetation and plants and trees also on day three. On day four, uh, set the sun and the moon to separate day from night. On day five, put uh, created, spoke into being the, the swimmers and the flyers, the, the, the creatures in the water and the, the, the creatures in the air. On day, on day six, created the livestock, the animals, and created humans and gave an instruction to be fruitful and multiply and to, uh, and he gave food for humans and livestock. Very interesting, because when you add up, add up the seven things that God spoke into being or that God said, you get ten. Seven things that he spoke into being, let us make or let there be, and then uh, the instructions, be fruitful and multiply, and I give food and, and, uh, and so on. So, there are ten words just like there are ten commandments. 
And in the plagues, there are ten plagues. And actually, as you set the plagues alongside the days of creation, the plagues that God sent on Egypt when Moses was sent to Pharaoh to say, let my people go. Pharaoh had enslaved the people of Israel in Egypt. And God sent Moses to go to Pharaoh because he'd heard the cry of his people in slavery. And, and Moses went and said, let my people go. And Pharaoh refused and kept hardening his heart. And as he did so, as he did so, there was a series of, um, a series of plagues that broke out. And, and in the order in the, 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 in the Exodus narrative, first of all, there was the, a plague of blood. The river Nile turned to blood. And then there was a plague of frogs where the land was swarming with frogs. Then there were a plague of gnats, biting insects that rose up as dust from the land. There was a plague of, of flies, of flying insects. There was a plague on the livestock where all of the cattle uh, of Egypt, and, and, and these were um, plagues that, that often afflicted the Egyptians but not the Israelites. There was a plague of boils on the skin of the Egyptians. There was a plague of hail. Uh, which damaged the crops and the, uh, the, 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 the vegetation. There was a plague of locusts, which ate what the light, whatever the hail had left behind. There was a plague of darkness, uh, where it was uh, permanently dark, but it was light in the area where the Israelites were. And finally, there was the plague on the firstborn, which was the plague that led to the Passover, to the Passover lamb and, and the, the, the angel of death passing over the houses of the Israelites so that their firstborn children were not, uh, firstborn sons were not, uh, were not, did not die. Why am I going through all of these? Because actually when you set the plagues alongside the days of creation and what God created, you discover that actually what God was doing in Egypt he wasn't just cursing the gods of Egypt, and you can see that each of these plagues was, a, if you like, a curse on the things that the Egyptians worshipped. But actually, this was a decreation. This was an uncreation. And, and let me just set them alongside each other. There was a, a plague of, of darkness. Well, it was God who separated light from darkness and said, let there be light. There was a plague of blood which affected the water that God had given when he separated sky from water. There was a plague of, of gnats which rose up from the land, and God had caused the land to emerge from the water to be good and fruitful. But here, the gnats rose from the land to be, uh, to be a pest and to be painful. There was a plague of uh, both the hail and the locusts, but, but God had given vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees for food for people. But the, the plagues of locusts and hail uh, attacked that gift. Again, a plague of darkness paralleling the, 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 the sun and the moon, the day and the night. There was a plague of frogs. God had spoken, and the Hebrew is, is, is exactly the same. In the creation narrative, he talked about let the waters teem with, let the waters swarm with life. And we're told in the, 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 the Exodus plague narrative that the water swarmed with frogs. Uh, there was a plague of flies, and God had uh, spoken airborne creatures, birds, and, and everything with winged creatures into being. But the flies were, were a pest. God had created the livestock. Well, the livestock all died in the plague on the livestock. God had spoken to the, um, God had given food for humans and for livestock, the locusts and the hail destroyed everything. And perhaps finally and most poignantly, God had spoken to Adam and said, be fruitful and multiply and go and fill the earth. And there was a plague that brought death to the children, the firstborn sons. And so at every point in the creation narrative, the Exodus plagues decreated, decreated that which God had given and spoken into being. And so, if you like, it was an image of Egypt being taken back, 
being taken back from a land of plenty and the givenness of God in creation, the bounty and the abundance that God had made, but being taken back to a place of uh, chaos and destruction. The Egypt that was at the end of these plagues was an Egypt that was battered. And at every level of God's creative gifting, they found themselves robbed of life, and they were back to that chaotic state or stage. Why is this significant? Because these last bowls of wrath, if you like, mirror these plagues. They mirror the plagues in the sense that here is a picture of the uh, as, as the bowls of wrath are pulled out, poured out, they're poured out on the places of God's creation and abundance. The first bowl of God's wrath is poured out upon the land. And we're told that as it was poured out upon the land, which was God's gift to the people, festering sores broke out, just like the boils that had been on the people of Egypt. We're told that the second bowl of wrath was poured out on the sea, and the sea turned to blood, resulting in the death of, of the, the aquatic creatures, the, the, the fish and all that swims, swims in the sea. And of course, the sea turned to blood, another image of the first plague in Egypt. On the third day, uh, the, 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 sorry, the third bowl of wrath that was poured out, the angel poured out on the rivers and the springs. And so, the drinking water turned to blood. Again, a picture of the Nile. And uh, the, uh, the fourth bowl that was poured out, poured out on, uh, w when it was poured out, the sun scorched people. So, the sun that was a gift to mark days and seasons, to bring heat and warmth and life to the planet, becomes the enemy of the people. And so, it's a similar picture as in the plagues where that which God gave for good and for life, water, air, land, the sun. I don't know if any of you have been watching, and here I'm betraying more of my television uh, prejudices here, but I've been watching Perfect Planet, uh, the David Attenborough series on BBC, which has been looking at a whole series of things, and, and the, surprisingly, the, the first one uh, was about volcanoes, and uh, why volcanoes are so important for the life of the planet, and looking at weather patterns, and looking at oceans, and looking at the sun, and so on. All of these core elements in creation that God has given and spoken. Now, David Attenborough didn't credit God with them, but those are the things that give and sustain life. And we know that when they work well, they work beautifully and powerfully to sustain life that when the, 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 the heat of the sun is, is uh, doing its job, then we uh, experience uh, life and health on the planet. But of course, when there's a buildup of, of uh, carbon emissions, and when the planet warms up, then we know that, that desertification takes place, we know that weather patterns are disrupted, and we know that the world that used to run well doesn't run well anymore. And so, the, the, the creation itself, when it works, is created and designed to work seamlessly, to be integrated and to work beautifully. And God has given His creation to produce abundance and diversity and richness and fullness of life. But of course, when it doesn't work well, it's a massive disaster. It's a massive disaster for life on the planet. Well, the imagery of these bowls of wrath, and, the, and the, the first four of them are the exact same sequence as the first four of the trumpet blasts on the land, on the sea, on the water, and on the, the stars and the sun, the, the heavenly uh, uh, bodies. Uh, but in the trumpets, there were only warnings. There was a restriction on how much of the world was affected. But here now, uh, there is an unrestricted uh, destruction, if you like, uh, a destroying of that. And so, the first four angels uh, are, are pictures of God deconstructing His creation. The fifth angel poured out His bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. We know that the, the kingdom of the beast 
was the, the kingdoms of empire, the kingdoms of this world, all the man-made human institutions where we think we reign and rule. And God was judging and pouring out a bowl of wrath. Because if all of, and we've seen this with coronavirus, we've seen how relatively easily all of the structures and the, 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 the um, kingdoms and the nations and the power bases of the world, how every single nation in the planet has been affected through coronavirus, through lockdown restrictions, impact on their economy, and, and life just not going on as usual anywhere in the world. So we already understand in this season, the fact there's only four of us in the church is testimony to the fact that just one relatively small thing like a virus can have such a seismic impact on the kingdoms of the earth. And that where it seems that we have unfettered control over our affairs and over the world, we discover actually that we don't. And so here is a picture of the, the God's judgment being poured out on, on human aspiration to reign and rule, to defy God. It's Psalm 2 that say the kings of the earth conspire together and seek to, and, and they laugh, they, they, they th seek to throw off their chains and mock and laugh at God. But God says in that Psalm, kiss the son lest he be angry. Kiss the son lest he be angry. For his wrath can flare up in a moment, but his goodness lasts for a lifetime, forevermore. And so the sixth angel pours out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, uh, and the water dries up. Now, we've seen the river Euphrates before. It appeared when the sixth trumpet blast was sounded. The river Euphrates in the east was the, 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 the river uh, on the other side of which were, was, was, if you like, the, the, the kind of um, the unknown territory, the territory where enemies came from. There be dragons, if you like, over on the other side of the Euphrates. And so anything coming from the other side of the Euphrates was generally a symbol uh, of, of trouble, of war, of attack, of an enemy invasion. And so the fact that the river Euphrates dries up means there's nothing now to stop that attack crossing over the dry riverbed of the Euphrates. I suppose it's a little bit like the Red Sea, uh, except the Egyptians were covered over by the, 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 the returning waters and, and they were killed as a measure of God's protection of His people. Well, here the river Euphrates is dried up to allow the enemy forces to advance and to come in and, and to move. And, and this particular part now, I know we've said in Revelation that, that much of it refers to the cycles of, of, of human history and, and empires that rise and fall, and, and so much of it refers to things that, that happen time after time after time. Revelation largely doesn't point to uh, one single person or one moment. So there's no point as we've been saying going along, there's no point in us trying to work out if this bit of revelation means here and now, because usually revelation refers to the same kinds of situations occurring in the world, uh, time after time after time, down through the pages of history, from the resurrection of Jesus until His return. But when we get to this sixth bowl, it starts to get very specific. Why? Because tucked in amongst the sixth bowl is a reference to the return of Jesus, which is a one-off specific event which is yet to happen. And so in the sixth bowl being poured out, we see these three impure spirits, uh, one from the dragon, one from the beast from the sea, and one from the beast from the land. And these demonic spirits go and entice three kings are going to entice uh, the kings of the whole world to gather them from battle on the great day of God Almighty. And they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. And so that's where Armageddon is a word that has, has uh, seeped into the consciousness and into our language quite considerably. Because Armageddon is, the, is, the, is our understanding of the last battle, if you like. 
And so the, the last action of the, the forces of, of, of Satan, who is the dragon, and the beast from the sea, which is uh, empire or, or nation state, and the, the beast from the land, which is the, the spokesman and the advocate, the representatives of those, the agents of those uh, empires and kingdoms. And so there's a picture here of, of, a, of, a, of a last battle, of a huge, vast battle. But tucked in amongst it, we have verse 15, which are the words of Jesus. Look, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and remains clothed so as not to go naked and be shamefully exposed. Tucked away in amongst all of this uh, awful vision of judgment is a vision of Jesus keeping his people. You know, we know from what Jesus said in the Gospels. He said, you know, in, in a nutshell, he said, it's going to get tough. <laughs> it's going to get tough in the world. It's going to get difficult and painful, and there'll be things happen uh, in the world that, that, will be, that will be hard, and there'll be an increase of wickedness. The love of most will grow cold. He who stands firm, or she who stands firm, the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Hang on in there. Hang on in there and hold fast in faith to the end. And through these judgments, uh, God holds and keeps His people if we lift up our eyes and fix them on Jesus, there is a victorious people standing on the other side of the sea, a people who will pass through and be his and kept to be his. And here on, on the eve, if you like, or, or somehow in and around the point of this one final cataclysmic battle, and who knows if, 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 this, if Scripture is envisaging some nuclear proliferation where suddenly everyone just decides to bomb everybody else with nuclear weapons and, and so on. That, that might be one way of interpreting the seventh bowl. But Jesus says, I come like a thief. Jesus is coming back for His people. He's coming back to rescue and to take home all those who fix their eyes and their hearts upon Him. And somehow, and there have been lakes of ink written over where and when and how and, and, and so on, where and when in relation to this final cataclysmic war that is envisaged here in Scripture, Jesus takes His people home. But He takes His people home. And so then we have this final uh, cataclysm, if you like. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, it is done. And then we have flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, a severe earthquake. We've seen those before in Revelation. They mark the end of a scene, the end of, a, of an episode. And the severe earthquake is one which has a destructive effect, and, and it's cropped up with the seven seals, the seventh seal, and the seventh trumpet, this massive, uh, a vision of a massive destructive earthquake. Is it set into motion by human uh, nuclear weapons? Is it a massive natural event that takes place? We don't know. But what we do know is that the, the great city split into three parts, that's Jerusalem, God remembered Babylon the Great. Babylon the Great represents all of the corrupt, fallen, irredeemable nations and kingdoms of the earth. The cities of the nations collapsed. And so this is a global phenomenon of, of destruction. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones, each weighing 40 kilograms, fell on people. And so, a final plague of, of hail, of destruction. None of this is cheery or cheerful reading, let's be honest. None of us, and particularly uh, in the middle of a pandemic, necessarily wants to focus on signs of, of judgment or, or the wrath of God. And in that sense, uh, I apologize if, if going over uh, the, the, the kind of challenging parts of Revelation is, is perhaps not the, 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 the kind of... Uh, reassurance or, or the warmth that, 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 that you need or are looking for. But I want to challenge you to see 
that actually be encouraged. Be encouraged. Because again and again and again through this book is Jesus' invitation and challenge and warning to us to hold fast to him. And I suppose I want to challenge myself and all of us that, you know, how is your faith and your relationship with Jesus holding out in a pandemic? You're probably fe feeling and, uh, and experiencing all sorts of emotional and spiritual and, and mental upheaval with the isolation and the lack of contact, the lack of Christian fellowship and so on. But perhaps this is a season where God is calling and challenging and inviting us to think, you know, if everything changes in the world, if everything suddenly changes, will you still be mine? Will you still pursue me? Will you still belong to me and come after me? Will you still pray and read my word? Will you still put your faith in me when, when things are disappointing or hard or difficult or challenging? You know, maybe an experience like the past year, as unwelcome and unpleasant has been, has also been a good refining experience. Because if the words of the book of Revelation point us to a time where trouble and difficulty and challenge will intensify, well, maybe coronavirus is a training ground for the church. Not a wanted or a welcome one, but an invitation for us to say, well, am I holding fast to my discipleship? Because if things will get world, uh, worse and more difficult, maybe this is boot camp where we learn to trust in the living God and not just to rely on, on, on the church or other people or fellowship to, to kind of bolster our faith. Here's an invitation and a call to us to make sure that we're walking with Jesus and not relying on other people to provide most of that for us. Jesus wants to take you home to a place of safety. He wants to bring you through, if you like, the sea of chaos and, and bring you safe on the other side to land you in the place of his new creation, where there'll be new heavens and a new earth. And we've still to come on to those beautiful passages at the end of the book where we, we, we see the new heavens and the new earth, where there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. But just like uh, a repair shop experience or a grand designs or any of the other uh, makeover shows that the nation is so passionately fond of, before you get to the new building, or the, the new and beautifully restored artifact, whether it be uh, whatever that might be. There has to be a, a hauling out, uh, a destruction of what is useless and, and irredeemable. And that's what this passage is all about. It's about the, the clear out and the slog. It's about the hardship and the difficulty where perhaps, uh, you know, money seems tight and the, the budget is rolling away and the, the project's taking longer and everyone's exhausted and short-tempered and worried and stressed and so on. There's a season of that that predates the emergence of something new and beautiful where you can look at it with awe and wonder and say, wow, look at that, that's fantastic. Well, that's where we're heading towards. But the invitation and the call and the challenge is to hold on in faith, to know that the living God is powerful and gracious and loving and merciful, that he's for you and not against you. But in this boot camp of coronavirus, of all of the challenges of this past year, let it be a season where we learn to grow, where we learn to grow close, where we learn to depend on God as we've never depended on him before. And we learn to know that he's trustworthy, even when everything in our world is not the way we want it. Let's pray together. Gracious God, our loving Father, we thank you. We thank you that you teach and train us that even in uh, an unwelcome season such as this past year, we can see, Lord, that there are lessons to be learned that there is formation taking place, that there's a challenge and a stretching and a deepening of our discipleship. And yes, Lord, we know that we live in a world where there is much that might make us anxious. And we hear of, of uh, worrying things. We know of nation states whose control of their people alarm us, whose oppression of minorities or others disturbs us and grieves us. And we know, Lord, that 
in many ways, that's been a feature of human history for, for, forever. And yet, we also understand, Lord, the, the intensification and the, 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 the trajectory of, of uh, possibilities. We understand, Lord, that the world is a, an uncertain place. We understand that uh, power shifts and ambitions and, and all of the things, Lord, that, that, that move human endeavor and ambition are uh, so often designed to take power and bring suffering. And so, Father, we ask that you help us to fix our eyes upon Jesus and not to be given to alarm or anxiety, but rather, Lord, to know that you are the God of all the earth, that Jesus is the Savior whose kingdom is firmly established and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, and that your Spirit is everywhere in the world, sustaining and building and growing your church and bringing us to fresh courage and confidence and faith. So come, Holy Spirit, we pray. Fill and strengthen and renew our hearts and help us, Lord, to believe that we are an Exodus people, a people who you have already sent a declaration to the forces of darkness to say, let my people go. And the Lord, you provide for us even where all around us there may be uh, darkness and pain and difficulty in our world. And yes, it touches our lives and those of those we love as well. But as we come to you, Father, we pray that you strengthen our confidence and we pray that you help us to hold fast to you in this world as we wait upon the time when Jesus will come and take us to the one that you've prepared and are preparing. Lord, we pray for our nation again. We pray once more because this week there are different people in intensive care. There are different people in critical conditions. And so we pray for them, Lord. We give thanks for those that have taken steps of recovery and healing. And we pray for those, Lord, that now particularly need a touch of healing and, and uh, restoration. We pray, Lord, for the beleaguered healthcare workers and frontline workers of the NHS and all those others in our society who put their lives on the line to keep society taking over as best it can under these circumstances. Lord, we pray for all those who are exhausted in the healthcare service and ask you, Lord, to restore and re-energize them and to comfort them. Lord, this past week in Scotland, we just think particularly of Cross House Hospital and uh, all of the staff and those in the Kilmarnock area who will be just grieving and affected by that terrible, uh, tragic uh, murder that happened uh, just the other day. Lord, again, we pray for our leaders and those in authority over us as they continue with scientific advisors and public health officials to make the best decisions that they can. And Lord, we pray for our world, conscious, Lord, of the things going on that disturb us. Lord, we think of the plight of the Uyghur people in China, and we pray, Lord, that pressure will be brought to bear that will uh, alleviate what appears to be a genocide taking place in that land. And we pray, Lord, for the deliverance of a people there who are being uh, oppressed, tortured, and killed, perhaps. Lord, we uh, pray for, this, for, for Russia at this time, recognizing, Lord, the, the, the rise of dissidents and the unsettled uh, voices of the people there. We pray for Burma, for Myanmar this week, and recognize, Lord, the, the unsettled situation that is there. And we pray, Lord, that justice and fairness will come and that voices of opposition, Lord, will be protected. Lord, this is a, a troubled world. We think of the people of Yemen, the, just the terrible the situation going on there with so many lives, uh, so many uh, lives just absolutely uh, starved and malnourished because of being caught in a conflict between surrounding nations. And Lord, we pray for an end to the war and for interventions that will bring real deliverance and help for the ordinary people. Lord, our world is a place of suffering and of trouble, but we believe, Lord, that you are a God who is firmly set on rescue and deliverance. And we pray, Lord, that you'll show us where and how we may be a sign 
of your grace and help. And Lord, we pray for one another. You know, Lord, where people are uh, lonely and isolated, weary and discouraged, perhaps uh, brokenhearted and, and just exhausted in amongst everything that this uh, pandemic and its consequences have taken out of them. Lord, would you come to our aid? Would you come to our help? Would you give us fresh vision and fresh hope? Would you encourage us? And Lord, we look forward to the time when we can uh, share in community and fellowship with one another again. But in the meantime, we ask you, Lord, to draw near to us and help us to draw near to you, that we might glorify your name and that Jesus might be seen in and through our lives. And all we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we're going to finish the service. Laura is going to uh, lead us in our last song, which is Reckless Love. Uh, so hand over to Laura.
And you have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. And you have been so, so good to me. Lord, thank you for your amazing, overwhelming, reckless love which pursues us, which comes after us to bring us home. And so now, may grace and mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be yours this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you so much for joining and being part of our live stream service today. We look forward to the time where we can be back together. If there's anything we can do to help or support you, minister at sgt.church is my email address. Drop me a line or put a message on the Facebook page. Uh, if you would like to reflect some more on these chapters of Revelation or anything that's caught your imagination or you want to talk about, the uh, talk back session at five o'clock today will be on. I'll put a Zoom link on the Facebook page and uh, in the SGT social chat, so maybe see one or two of you there. But uh, otherwise, I hope you have a good week. Look forward to being with you again uh, in, uh, next weekend. God bless you. Bye-bye.